Okay. So, hi everybody. This is the first seminar this semester, and I did send the schedule around, so be sure you're keeping your eye out for anything you're interested in. Uh, today, we have Hozu Arakotekia from King's College London, and he'll be finishing his PhD this semester, but he's already accepted a postdoc at Oxford, so that's really great and exciting. And he's gonna be talking about gravitational wave production. Um, so we usually save questions for the end, or you can type them in the chat, uh, so go ahead. Okay, hi everyone, so my name is Yosu. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about gravitational waves from cosmic strings. And this is work done in collaboration with Thomas Helfer, who is a postdoc in John Hopkins University, and Eugenium, which is my supervisor at King's College London, and it's based on these two papers. If there is something that is not clear, even though maybe you wait until the end, please uh, just ask me. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with stopping now. Okay, so what is this talk about? So I have here some movies, hopefully you can see them. So in this talk, we are gonna explore the first general relativistic simulations of cosmic strings. So using numerical relativity techniques, we are gonna study how a circular cosmic string loop, such as the one shown here, will collapse and what the emission of gravitational waves is and how it looks like. So we are gonna use adaptive mass refinement uh, methods to resolve the, the simulation. And as I'm gonna show you here, on the top part, you're gonna see the movie, so the evolution of the energy density of a cosmic string loop. And on the bottom is the plus polarization of the two zero mode of the strain with time. So this is how the gravitational wave uh, looks like. So you see that as the loop collapses, it accelerates, it forms a black hole, as you can see here. There is the merger here and the standard ring down that we expect when we have a black hole that is excited. Okay, so, but before talking about all of that, we should talk about what are cosmic strings. So cosmic strings are topological defects that are uh, expected to have been found in the very early universe. So as you can see here, they are stable matter configurations that are like one dimensional. They form during a phase transition in the early universe and they come as in a network. So you see that here you have many of them. So this network evolves and self intersects with other parts of the strings and you can form these closed loops, such as the ones you shown here. And these loops can oscillate or collapse. So how do they form? So before talking about a cosmic string formation, I think it's easier to understand this with domain walls. So domain walls are two dimensional topological defects. So imagine that in your very early universe, right, you have some scalar potential such as the one shown here with one minimum here. So then all your universe is happy to be here in the least energetic configuration. But as the universe expands, right, the temperature uh, goes down and temperature corrections might develop uh, new minimums, such as those ones here, which don't have this set to symmetry that this one had. So the symmetry is broken in this minimum. So the universe that was initially at this point is not happy to be here. You can see that it's pretty sad because it wants to fall into less energetic configuration. So it wants to go to this minimum. So here on the left uh, plot, I'm showing you exactly the same, but in the right one, I'm showing you the universe made by different Hubble patches, right? So these are different regions that cannot talk to each other. So what can happen is that some regions will fall into the pink vacuum and other ones into the blue vacuum, as you can see here. And as they cannot talk to each other, this will randomly happen. Now, imagine that you are someone here and wants to walk in space to this uh, causally disconnected universe. So what this will correspond in field, in field space is going up the potential and going down again. So in the boundary between these two regions, you can see that you have some trapped energy. And this trapped energy is what we call the main one. So for cosmic strings, this, uh, this, they are a generalization of domain walls. They are one-dimensional objects. And instead of breaking a potential that has a set to symmetry, we break a U1 symmetry. So now instead of having just two equivalent Papua, oh, what you have is infinite number of them, right? So again, the universe from having all the causally disconnected patches uh, into the same part of the field space, this is gonna uh, fall down into different vacua. 
and again, there can be some very peculiar uh, points here. So if you look at one of these points, you see that the field configuration here is pink, orange, green, and blue. Pink, orange, green, and blue. And you can see that actually around this point, we are going once around the minima. So again, if we are an observer here who wants to walk in space towards this point, in field space, this corresponds to going up the potential. So again, we have some trapped energy here. And this is what uh, corresponds, or this is what we call a cosmic string. So if instead of having a slice here, you stack different slices, this will be an infinite string. So the fact that we are going once around the minima uh, is what we are going to call winding number. So if we go once in this direction, it's going to be plus one. And if we go in the opposite direction, we are going to have uh, minus one. So this will correspond like to a string that is going into the screen or going out of the screen. Good. So people have simulated this for many years, their formation. So this is uh, some simulation that you can see here where this network forms and you can form this closed loops here that collapse. So let, let me play that again. But most of these simulations are done in a lattice uh, using a flat space. So they, there are no back reaction effects or in expanding background. So they don't take into account general relativity. And also they usually have fixedness in the sense that they cannot improve the resolution while the network is evolving. So in our work, uh, we studied the first general relativistic simulations of cosmic strings with adaptive mass refinement. For those who don't know what this is, I think this movie shows this pretty clear. So if you have a loop such as the one here that is collapsing, you can see how the resolution of the, of the system or of the code that you are using is being adjusted by the dynamics of this, of this system. So that you just need to resolve properly the regions that are interesting and not maybe some part here where nothing is happening. So the good news of adding general relativity in our code is that we can capture field interactions with full back reaction effects. So what this means is that we can study strong gravity phenomena, so for example, black hole formation, or maybe more interestingly for, for LIGO viewer and Kagra detectors and the future LISA, we can start waveforms. Of course, one of the bad points of adding general relativity is that the simulations become more expensive and we cannot simulate the full network yet. So what we are gonna be looking at is individual events. Okay. So the, the motivation for this work is uh, the detection of gravitational waves on 2015. So here you can see the data from Humford and Livingston detectors, right? And how it was perfectly matched or how it was fitting perfectly with a, a simulation of, with a template that was extracted from binary black hole simulation. And this is the way we could know that this was a binary merger of black holes with certain masses. So what if we go again to the Humford and Livingston strain data and instead of scanning this with uh, templates from binary black holes, what if we scan them with new templates? For example, cosmic strings or maybe boson stars or other compact objects. Maybe if we scan them, we can see that there is some match filtering so that we can fit our templates to the data and claim that there is uh, some detection of cosmic strings or other objects. So in the same way as it is done in binary black hole, we have detected many, many, many individual events. I think it's about 50 by, at this point, but we have not detected the stochastic background yet. In the field of cosmic strings, most of the work that has been done is focusing on the stochastic background, which has not been detected, but that doesn't mean that we should not see an individual event. So what we are gonna be looking is at these individual events. So for example, um, a loop that collapses or a string that radiates a gravitational waves. This is what is known as CASP. Okay, so the numerical setup, what are we doing here? So we are using numerical relativity, which is basically solving Einstein's equations in a computer. And the standard approach to do that is decomposing uh, the space-time metric in the so-called three plus one decomposition here, right? So what we are gonna be doing is you take the space-time and you are basically uh, taking hyperslices three-dimensional hyperslices that will evolve in time so that you can solve this as an initial value problem. So what this means is that we are gonna specify some initial data 
that will satisfy some constraints as we are gonna see later, and this will evolve following some evolution of gradients. So in this three plus one decomposition, you can see that this gamma ij is what is known the free metric, which is the intrinsic metric to the three dimensional hyper slice. And then we're gonna have the laps and the shifts, which are dynamical gauge conditions. So some other relevant quantities is the, are the extrinsic curvature, which is shown here, and it's approximately like the time derivative of the free metric, and it encodes the information of how this three-dimensional hyperslice is embedded into the full space-time. So if you take the, the trace of this uh, extrinsic curvature tensor, you get the, what is on the expansion, and for those who are more uh, familiarized with uh, FRW or with cosmology, this will correspond to the Hubble parameter. We're gonna define some projector. You don't need to, to, to remember how this projector look like, looks like, but this is basically what is gonna take our four dimensional quantities in GR and project it into the hyperslice or orthogonal to the hyperslice. So if we take Einstein's equations and we project them, what we get is this Hamiltonian constraint here and the three momentum constraints. So in the Hamiltonian constraint, sorry, this is the rich scalar of the three metric of gamma I, ij. And here we are gonna have the energy density and the momentum density. These are just different uh, projections of the energy momentum tensor. So in the case in which you have just black holes in vacuum, so no matter, you can forget about these terms and you only need these terms here. So something that is important here is that these equations are not evolution equations. They are constrained equations in the sense that they need to be satisfied at all times. If you are not satisfying them, then you are not solving GR. You are not consistent with GR. So the initial data that you specify needs to satisfy them and then during evolution, they will be still satisfied. So in addition to these four constrained equations, if we do this three plus one decomposition, we get some evolution equations, which I mean, I'm not gonna get into that, but basically we are using the BSSN formulation, which has been proven to be, uh, or has been proven to provide long stable simulations of uh, general relativity simulations. So the approach then is, okay, we are gonna have some initial data that needs to satisfy these constraints. And once we have the constraints that are satisfied, we are gonna evolve. Okay. <clears throat> Regarding the matter sector, we are uh, studying abelian Higgs strings, which is one of the most popular models. So this is the Lagrangian that you can see here. And basically our strings are made of a complex scalar field here, pi and Pascal, and a gauge field. So we are gonna have some current where D mu is the gauge, the standard gauge derivative with some charge. And in our simulations, we're gonna keep this charge uh, fixed to one number, so we don't need to vary it. And then the potential that we take that has this U1 symmetry broken is the standard Messier can have potential that looks like this equation, where lambda is the standard uh, coupling constant. And again, same, same as uh, for the charge, we are gonna keep, keep it fixed. The most important parameter for us is gonna be eta, which is known as the symmetry breaking scale here. And for those who have heard about cosmic strings, uh, it's very important, this number is very important for probably the most important parameter in terms of in, in the field of cosmic strings, which is the string tension, this dimensionless uh, quantity, g mu, where mu is the energy per unit length. So if we learn something about string tension, right, we can relate using this formula, and we can learn something about some high energy theory or some symmetry breaking scale eta. Good. Um, similar to, to GR, in just pure general relativity, we have uh, these four constraints that I was talking before. For this matter field, if we have a um, U, U1 abelian Higgs theory, we also need to satisfy this Gauss constraint here. And to do that, what we are gonna be doing is uh, using this nab worker baumgarte formalism, which basi is based on just introducing some auxiliary variable set with some evolution equation that is gonna change the properties of the evolution equations that you are solving and adding some dumping constant can stabilize this thing here. So if we didn't do this, this gauss constraint, even though it is satisfied initially, the evolution will drive it to some 
a large value. So our simulations will crash. And following this formalism in here, we can stabilize the equation. Okay. Good. So I think this is the technical part. So from now on, I think we should see more movies and more and more animations. So how can we proceed here? So once we have the evolution equations that are coded, we can study different phenomena. And as I said, the, the way to do this is specifying the initial data. So if we want to study an infinite static string, we need to solve the constraints for this, and then evolve. If we want to study a circular string loop, we need to solve the constraints and then evolve. So for the infinite static string, this is the way we do it. So here I'm showing you a sketch of what will correspond to an infinite static string. So here you see that this along the set directions and we are gonna have periodic boundary conditions. And you see that this system has a radial or cylindrical symmetry. So we can put ansatz for the complex field, the gauge field and the metric of the space time that only depend on, on the cylindrical radius. And then how do we solve the constraints? So to, for this system, we are gonna have the Einstein's equations and also the matter equations that come from this matter Lagrangian. So the way we, we start is, okay, we are gonna solve for a phi and A in flat space. Once we have a flat space solution, we can reconstruct what the energy momentum tensor is and solve for the metric using Einstein's equation. Once we have this new metric, we can go back and solve again for the fields in this new metric. We can reconstruct the energy momentum tensor and, and, and solve for the new metric and so on. So we can look here until we see that our solutions are converging to some value. And once we see that we are getting convergence, we can uh, end this process and, and get uh, the solution. So once we have this solution, right, which is uh, cylindrically symmetric, we can read it in, we can put it in our three plus one code. So here I'm showing you the energy density of an infinite static string, right, which is, which has periodic boundary conditions along the set direction. And you can see that nothing is happening, which is pretty boring, but I think it's good news because if it is static, this is what will happen, right? You, you can see here how the time is evolving and nothing is happening. So we can quantify this a bit more by studying how these constraints are performing. So this is the average of the Hamiltonian constraint. And you can see that this, it should be zero. And for us, it's 10 to the minus eight. And not only that, but it is stable. So our, um, our simulations are quite robust. So here I'm showing you the constraint, the Gauss constraint. And you see that if you don't introduce this formalism that includes this dumping, you have this growth in the evaluation of the constraint. So our simulations at some point will crash. But if you dump it with this uh, technique, you see that you can stabilize. Okay. So even though this infinite static string is pretty boring, the reason why we did this is because we can use this to test our code. Once we have an infinite static string, we can say, okay, our code is working and we can study a bit more interesting phenomena. And this is the cosmic string loop collapse. <clears throat> okay, so again, as we need to solve the constraints, how do we get the initial data for a loop, a circular loop? So we have the solution for one infinite static string, as we said, and the way we are gonna construct the loop is by identifying the periodicity in set that I was talking before with some periodicity on theta. So this nicely is like, you take the string, you cut it and you uh, stitch it together. So what you get is a circular loop here. So this is regarding the matter fields. This system still has a lot of uh, symmetry. Right? If I take a 2D slice here, you can see that this looks like a string that is pointing out of the screen that is R distance away, where R is the radius of the loop, and a string that is going into the screen. So using polar coordinates, we can simplify this even, even more. Right? And we get that the, what we need to solve for gravity is a string that is R distance away in polar coordinates. So how do we solve for gravity? So as I, I was saying before, we have this gamma IJ, which is the three metric of, of the system. So it's the metric of the hyperspace. If we choose some conformally flat 
uh, answers, the situation here, right? We, where k is the conformal factor, the Hamiltonian constraint that we need to solve is this one here, right? So rho is the energy density of a string. K are gonna vanish, so we can choose them to vanish because our, our loop is initially, initially stationary. And using these ansatz for the three metric, right? We are gonna get some uh, differential equation for chi, if we put it here for the Ricci scale. So if we solve that, we have the initial data for gravity too. But as I was saying before, we also have these three momentum constraints. But as we are choosing our loop to be initially stationary, uh, they are trivially satisfied. So we don't need to worry about that. Okay. So just as a recap of, of uh, the parameter space that we have. So for the string, the, for the infinite string, we were only changing one parameter, which was the string density, right? If we increase it, we get more massive strings. For loops, we also have now another parameter, which is the radius of the loop. And as we are gonna see in a in second, increasing the radius of the loop will make the uh, loop more massive, right? So if we have a string loop as this one, so the mass of this system is the length of the loop, which is two pi r, times the energy per unit length u. So you see that increasing the radius, you are just making the loop larger. So the length of the loop is uh, longer and you have more mass. Okay, so once that we have now the, the initial data, again, we are gonna evolve it with BSS and uh, evolution equations. What you can see is that the loop is gonna collapse given some tension. So you can think about this as a rubber band that you are stretching it. And then when you leave it, it will collapse. And then with the code, we are gonna study what's gonna happen next. Okay. So here I'm showing you, okay, let's see if it works. Yeah, here I'm showing you two simulations with the same string tension, but different radius. So the mass of this system is smaller than the mass of this disk. What you can see in the left plot or in the left movie is that the loop collapses and then the energy is dispersed. So there is no loop anymore and there is, the energy has been radiated. Whereas in the right hand side here in this movie, right, let's just look at it again. The radius of the loop is larger. So the loop is more massive and you can see how there is no radiation of matter, but everything fall is gonna fall within the, the event horizon. So you can see here. Okay. So maybe something we wanted to ask here is, can we predict this or why is this happening? Why in one case there is no loop and in the other one we have a, a, a black hole. So again, if I take a 2D slice, what you can see here is that this looks like a string that is going out of the screen and one that is going in. So this is like you have a string with winding number minus one and winding number plus one. So the total winding number of the system is zero. What this means is that this system is topologically unstable. So the string is not happy to be there. The string wants to unwind in, in some way. So something else that we can look here is that we have uh, some, the string has some thickness, which is delta, some radius of the loop, that is the parameter that we are changing. And given the mass of the system, it's gonna have some Schwarzschild radius. So if I play this, what is happening is that the loop is collapsing, but not all the energy is getting into the Schwarzschild radius. And what happens is that the plus one winding number is gonna cancel the minus one winding number. So the string unwinds and emits all the energy to infinity. In the second case, we are taking the same string. So the thickness is exactly the same, but the radius of the loop now is larger. What means is that the Schwarzschild radius is also larger as you can see here. And in this case, when the loop collapses, all the energy can fall, all the mass can fall into the Schwarzschild radius. So then a black hole forms. So this is basically hope conjecture. And we can get that the condition for black hole formation is that the Schwarzschild radius, 2m of the system, has to be larger than the string thickness. And from this, we can get that the a condition for the radius, that if you choose some string tension, and the loop is larger than some R predicted by this formula, 
you will form a black hole. What you can see here is that if you go to very low string tensions, so strings that are very light, you need a larger and larger uh, black, um, loop to form, to form a black hole. So if we think a bit about a uh, LIGO Birgon Tagra and the uh, sensitive frequencies, so they are sensitive to about 100 solar masses. So for the constraints that we have actually uh, right now for, for cosmic strings that are 10 to minus 10, 10 to minus 10, the loops that uh, will fall and form black holes and will fall into the LIGO Virgo Kagra sensitivity band would be about 10, uh, 10 to the three astronomical units. So these are about solar system size loop. So if you have a solar system size loop with this string tension, some distance away, and it's close enough that you can see the event, their uh, gravitational wave should fall into the LIGO Virgo Kagra sensitivity band. So something we checked here in using our simulations was uh, how, how good is this formula? So you can see here on purple is the prediction from this formula. So if I choose some parameter space here, G mu and R, if I choose some point here, it should form a black hole. And this is what you can see here, where the dots are the simulation points. Uh, if you see that if you go below in this region, you are not gonna form a black hole just because your loop is not massive enough. Something as we checked was with Nambugoto. So Nambugoto is the model that assumes that the strings are really, really infinitesimally thin. So they don't need to take into account uh, the interaction. And in this model, the loops behave as a cosine here. So here I'm showing you how the radius of the loop changes as time evolves, right? So how the loop is collapsing. So you can see in the dots that this is our simulation and it agrees pretty well with the Nambugoto model until it reaches about the thickness. So when the loop radius is about the thickness, you cannot consider the strings as one dimensional. So you, you deviate from Nambugoto. But what is really remarkable here is that when the black hole forms or when the string collapses, uh, the loops are moving at 0.97C. And as we will see later, this can go even higher. So these are really ultra relativistic events and we can use them to test uh, GR or if we see some strong gravity phenomena here. So, so now that we know that loops come from black holes, uh, how do gravitational waves from these systems look like? So if I, if I have a loop, as I said, that is some distance away from us here and it collapses, forms a black hole and emits gravitational waves, what we want to know is, okay, what is the signal that we should be looking at in our detectors? Okay. So this is something you can see in, the, in this plot here. Okay, so this is the mass normalized psi four. So this is the Newman Penrose scalar. This is the quantity that we use in numerical relativity to compute gravitational waves and is the second derivative of the strain. So here I'm showing you the Q zero mode of a loop that has this string tension here, six times to minus three and some radius. And what you can see is that you have a merger and then the ring down of the black hole. This region here that is, uh, that looks a bit weird is just because we have junk radiation and this is quite uh, normal in numerical relativity simulation that when you put your initial data, it is a bit excited and emits uh, extra gravitational waves in the beginning. But this is not what we are interested. So here I'm showing you again the gravitational wave that is normalized with the mass of the system, so the psi four norm, for different loop radius. So here we fix the string tension and we vary the, the radius of the loop. And what we can see is that the, the signal that we get is about the same. So if we normalize it with the mass, the waveform looks pretty much the same. So we say that the waveform is weakly dependent with the geometry of the system. Now, instead of keeping fixed G mu and varying the radius, what we are gonna do is let both parameters change, right? So in this plot here, I'm showing you again the normalized waveform. You can see for different string tensions and different radius. So something you can see here is that the loudest event, right? If you look at which signal has the largest amplitude, is the one that corresponds to the smallest string tension. And this is quite counterintuitive because this plot is suggesting that loops that are 
lighter. So maybe they are more massive, but they are lighter. In, the strings are, have lighter string tension. They produce more gravitational waves. So the strings that couple less to gravity produce more gravitational waves, right? This is what you can see in this figure. Why? So the, the, the way we understood this was by looking at the velocity of the, of the loop. So as I said, the loop radius behavior is well approximated by this form here. If I take the time derivative of this radius, what we get is the velocity, which is a sine of t. And now we know that black hole formation happens when the radius of the loop reaches its structure radius, right? which is this one here. Two times the mass, but the mass is 2 pi r d mu. So this is the way we, we get it. From here, we can know when this happens. So from putting this equation here, we can solve for t. And then we can put this t into the velocity. So we know what is the velocity of the loop when it forms a black hole. And what we see is that this is uh, what we get. So the first thing that you can notice here is that it doesn't depend on, on the radius. So no matter how big the loop is, if you fix the string tension, it will always uh, form the black hole at the same velocity. And the other thing that you can see is that if you take the string tension to zero, so if you switch off this parameter, you are making the event more and more relativistic. So the lighter strings are colliding at uh, faster velocities. This is something that you can also see here in the gamma factor. Right? If I take the g mu that is 10 to the minus eight, this is gonna be huge. So then as we see that loops that have lighter strings produce more gravitational waves, we believe that the reason why this is happening is because gravitational waves are dominated by kinematics because loops that have lighter uh, string tensions are colliding at faster velocities. And this is something that we can quantify here, right? Here I'm plotting the energy that is emitted in gravitational waves with respect to uh, with the initial mass. So we know, for, I think the first light event was about uh, 30 solar masses, each black hole, uh, each black hole, and then in the end, I think it was six solar masses of energy were emitted in gravitational waves. That was about 6%. So in this case, what we see is that it is much louder than in black hole head-on collision, right? For black hole head-on collisions, this is about 0.06%. And for us, we see that is in the order of 1, 2%. And what is interesting here is that the, sl the smaller g mu you take, this curve goes higher and higher and higher. Okay, but now if we want to look for this in, in, in detectors, right, what we need is the strain waveform. So not the psi 4 for, uh, waveform that I was showing before, but the strain, this one here. So we have to reconstruct. So Maybe the first thing that we need to ask is, do we need to do that? Or is it degenerate with black hole head-on collisions? So we know that for in spirals, it is not gonna be the same because we don't have the in spiral part in the beginning, but for head-on collisions, it looks uh, pretty similar. So if I have a black hole, a loop that is forming here, a black hole at some distance, and the same mass black hole, how does it look? So if you can see here, the psi form uh, waveform, you see that the black, hole uh, the black hole waveform and the loop collapse at the same distance are very different. And this is not surprising because the loop is 30 times more energetic, so the amplitude should be larger. But what if you have the black hole instead of at the same distance, if you have it a bit closer? It might be degenerate with the distance. What we see here is that if you have, for example, a loop collapsing at some distance and a head-on collision of black holes at 16 times closer, you see that the ring down is exactly the same. But the merger is completely different, just because it's a different process. So what this means is that if you have access to the full waveform, you should be able to disentangle them. So what this means is that we need to construct waveforms specifically for cosmic strings. So in the, in the same way as this was, or as this is done in binary black holes, right, where we have the in spiral, where you use post-Newtonian techniques, when you have the merger where you use numerical relativity and then the ring down when you use a uh, perturbation theory, we are gonna construct the equivalent one for the string loop. So in, note here that I'm not writing the strain because what we extract from simulations is the Neumann Prendorf scalar, psi four. And this in principle is just the, the, the second uh, derivative of the strain. So in the infall, we can use weak field gravity. In the merger, we are using numerical relativity and the ring down, again, perturbation theory. 
So in principle, if I want to reconstruct what the strain is, I just need to integrate these twice. But as you can see here, we have this little bump here, which is related to this junk radiation that I was talking before, that is intrinsic to numerical relativity simulation. So what this is gonna do is destroy the signal in this region here if I want to integrate it twice. So if I take that psi form that I have and I integrate it twice, I see that I'm gonna get the strain that we want plus some a term that multiplies with two and some two integration constant. We are gonna set the first one to zero. This is just for energy conservation uh, considerations. So what we get from here is the strain plus some shifting constant. So if I take that waveform and I integrate twice, this is what we get here. So this is again the plus polarization of the two zero mode. You see that we have this ring down, the merger, and then this part here where we are integrating over this junk radiation. So we cannot trust this part. So if we want to have the full waveform with the info, we need to reconstruct this using different methods. So for the info, we can use weak gravity, as we said. And the standard way that people do, uh, I think one of the exercises I did in my undergrad for a GR when you are studying spiral is using the quadruple formula to get the strain. The problem with that quadruple formula for us is that it is only valid at low speeds. And as I said, our loop is collapsing at 0 0.96. So we are gonna use this full expression here where gamma IJKL is the projector with the TP gauge and TKL is gonna be the energy momentum tensor of a number water stream. So this model that is one dimensional. So if we integrate or if we solve that, what we get is that the two zero mode, right? Looks like this. The loop starts from rest, starts to accelerate. And then at some point we cannot trust this anymore because the black hole should form. So, and some gravity effects come into play. So if we want to match the info with the merger and the ring down, what we have is the black line here, which is the simulation that we have. So this is the psi four, a signal that we integrate twice and has this young radiation here. And for the info, we have this weak gravity black line. So as I said, this part, we cannot trust it for the simulation part because we have this young radiation. And this region here, we cannot trust it for the uh, red line because we are using weak gravity and when the black hole form, we are uh, having strong gravity effects. But as you can see here, there is some region where these uh, two should match. And the way we make this uh, to match is that, as I said before, when we integrate this twice, we have still a shifting freedom. So we can shift all this signal by some constant. And you can see here that if I shift this by some certain constant, I can make, the, make them both uh, fit. So the final waveform is this one here, right? You can see that the loop starts to collapse, you have the merger and the ring down. And here on solid line, you will see numerical relativity calculation and in dash line, the weight gravity calculation. So something that you can notice here is that if I go to T minus infinity, and if I go to T plus infinity, I'm not getting the same strain. And this is what is called gravitational wave memory. And it was well studied in the 1780s and in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And ba basically this is a permanent shift in the detectors. I, I mean, to be honest, I have no idea. When I when we got this, I, I didn't know if I if I was gonna trust this because I didn't know about uh, gravitational wave memory. But this basically what means is that if you have your detectors, right, that has uh, the arm of your detector that have uh, some length, right, the signal passes, so you, they oscillate as usual, but instead of going back to their normal or their previous uh, length, they relax to a new one. So this is what this signal is causing here, the permanent shift. And the reason why this is happening is, is you can, following these papers, you can approximate this uh, using this formula. So don't, don't worry about it because the, basically the only thing that is saying is that if you have outgoing matter radiation with some velocity and some anisotropy, and it's different from the ingoing one, you should have this permanent shift. So in our case, in going, we have a loop that is from start, starting from rest. So the velocity is zero. So this term we don't need to worry about. But this one here, we have some uh, 
when the loop collapses, as we will see uh, in, in the next slide, we have two jets of matter that have been emitted. So we have ultra relativistic emission of these moving elements at the speed of light in a very anisotropic way. And with actually, I think it's about 0.1% of the, of the loop uh, mass, initial mass. If I go to this movie here, okay, I cannot do any spoiler yet. So here I'm showing you the 2D slice of this loop again. So the color blue is the uh, energy density and chi here is the conformal factor that I was uh, talking about before. So if the conformal factor goes to values that are close to zero, you are forming a black hole. So what you can see is that the loop starts to collapse, accelerates. You can already see here how it is Lorentz contracted, the string, just because it is moving really, really fast. And then you form a black hole, right? And then there you have these two jets that are emitted along the set direction that we believe are the ones responsible for, for the gravitation wave memory. And in fact, if you quantify how much mass has been emitted, or maybe easier, if I go to this formula here and I plug in these values, so what is the velocity of these jets, what is the direction of emission and how much mass they go in them, we get about 14 uh, delta x to be 14, and you can see here that it's about 20. So this gives a really good prediction. So just to, to uh, end the talk, so some ongoing and future work. So here we were all the time looking at the L2 M0 modes, that was here, but we can also get the all L4 M0 mode or higher modes. And something I said is that this system is uh, it's not degenerate to the inspirer because you don't have an inspiral in the beginning. However, what if you have a very massive black hole or a very massive merger, such as the GW19 0521, I think, one, two years ago, that we could only see the merger and the ring known. Then in that case, maybe this signal is degenerate with those ones. So maybe you are detecting a very massive, maybe you are getting this signal and you are saying, oh, this is a, bin a very massive binary black hole. But maybe it is, it could look like a loop too, that is collapsing. So in this publication here with Andy Williamson, Thomas Helfer, Eugene Lim and Samaya Nisanke, we are looking at if you can use higher modes for the mode content, so just knowing how the L4 mode looks like, to do some analysis and disentangle or difference between very massive binary black holes or atypical gravitational wave progenitors. By atypical gravitational wave progenitors, I just mean some exotic event. And some of the work we are doing is uh, yes, traveling waves, so colliding two traveling waves on a string and getting the gravitation waves from this system. But uh, for now, I think I'm gonna end here. I'm happy to, to, answer, to answer any questions. And just the summary is that in this talk, we studied how circular cosmic string loop collapse using numerical relativity. They accelerate to ultra relativistic speeds and they come from black holes if they are massive enough. These black holes are excited and produce a peculiar gravitational wave signal that looks like this thing here, where you have the infall merger quasi normal modes with a large memory contribution. And I think this is all for me. So thanks very much. Thanks for inviting. And if you have any questions, please uh, ask them. Yeah. Thank you. That was really cool. Um, let me, yeah, you can clap on the mic. Uh, there is one question in the chat, and I have a couple questions too, but let me. Andrew, do you want to ask yours out loud or should I read it? <laughs> I'll read it. Okay. Andrew says, is there any known case where the hoop conjecture is violated? I, so you mean in this case or in general? Because in our cases, we haven't seen it violated. I also have to say that I think it's, I think it's quite hard to see it violated because when you go close to this boundary here, you need lots and lots of resolution. So I think it's pretty hard. But if you are asking about in more general, as far as I know, and we usually, we use it a lot in numerical relativity, it always works really, really well. So I don't know any case where the hoop conjecture has not been useful for us. Do you have like a two sentence explanation of what the hoop conjecture is? 
Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> the Hubble detector is basically if you if you have so if you have some mass that you can enclose it within some radius that is smaller than two times the um, oh, right? yeah. The Hubble conjecture says that you will form a black hole. Okay. But you just need to get some mass to be in less space, right? Squeeze it in less than two GM. If you do that, you form a black hole. Okay. And as far as I know, this has not been proven. So it is not, it is just a mm. conjecture. But it okay. works really, really well. Um, my question was, I, I'm kind of interested in like the time scale of these loops. Yeah. So like they form the Big Bang. What is the time scale of these collapses? Is it dependent on your, like the tension in your string or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it depends on many things. So when you, the string forms, or when the, when the network forms, you don't form circular loops, right? You form, some of them will be oscillating, some of them will be circular, some of them will be doing the different things. So depending which loop you are looking at, they will, uh, they will collapse earlier or faster. So I think the easiest way to get some time scale is if imagine, so here I was talking about these loops, for example, that are with this bounce and they are the size of the solar system. This only takes about days. Think that the loop is collapsing at 0 0.996 D. So it's really relativistic. No matter if the radius is that big, I think we calculated for this case, and I think it was about 10 days or something like that. But again, as you have a, a huge spectrum of loops, mm -hmm. not just this radius, you should expect uh, all possibilities, like all time scales. So it's happening like at every redshift. So when we yes. use like LIGO or something, we're just like searching for a specific like <laughs> size and time scale. And yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. it depends on the, on the loop radius and of course, on the population. So how many of these loops do you have, right? Yeah. If you have, depending on how many you have, maybe they will collapse earlier or later. And this, I don't think we can answer this question with our, our simulations. If you want to get the answer of what the time scales are, uh, I think this is better than with the network simulations. But what these people see in network simulations is that you are producing all the time loops because as the universe is expanding, huh. the strings are getting stretched and it gets, they get to some, what is called a scaling solution because the strings are stretched, but at the same time, they are being chopped off, forming loops. So you okay. have a production, continuous production of loops. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, there's another question. Um, are there other astrophysical observations, for example, lensing that constrain loop properties? Yeah. So I, I don't think there are specific constraints on loops, but they are, they are on the strings. And yeah, you, you're absolutely right. You have lensing, you also have uh, PTAs. And I think the first one was the CMB, just measuring uh, length in the CMB. Those are the mm -hmm. first ones uh, that were constraining the, these parameters, the string tension. But they are not constraints on the loop. They are constraints on the string tension. So on your theory, yeah. But that's absolutely, absolutely right, yeah. I think, we, I think this is interesting now because we have gravitational waves, right? But they have been constrained for the last 20 years, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, you can type it in the chat or unmute yourself. I do wanna ask one more. <laughs> are there any um, LIGO observations that you like really expect are not like a binary black hole? Because I know some of the controversy is that the black holes are just too big. Like the measurements they get, they're like, how are you getting a hundred solar mass black hole at that time? So are there any that you like think might be loops? Oh, to be, so, um, if I have to bet money between <laughs> black holes or loops, I would bet for black holes. Okay. Just because we know they exist. <laughs> and, and these ones, I mean, we don't know. I think that's, I think my main point of, of the talk would be, okay, I don't know if loops exist, but with this work that we did, we can search for them. Yeah. And this would be just creating some templates as they have for, for LIGO Virgo and scanning through the data. But yeah, I mean, we don't know what is out there, so, so <laughs> I cannot say. But yeah, okay. we'll bet for black holes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. Okay, um, well, if there are no more questions. Let's thank our speaker again. It was really good. Um, 
And I guess I'll see you all next week.